In this video we're going to talk about frequency distributions and we're going to look at the simplest case of frequency distributions when we have discrete variables. But before we do that I want to pick up on an issue that we discussed in measurement but we didn't really complete. And In the measurement video we talked about what we measure and how we measure things but we didn't talk about the unit of analysis. And so before we get to frequency distributions I'd like to take a quick look at that. So this comes a little bit under the topic of data aggregation. Um, it, there's lots of different ways of explaining this concept, but let's just look at one where we measure people. We could be measuring um, something like income uh, based on people, and here I've divided up the United. I have a graphic dividing up the United States into very small units. In particular, these are uh, counties, and there's over 3,000 different counties. Within counties, there are um, block units, and within blocks, there are homes, and within the homes, there are people. So this is getting partially at what we mean by aggregation. If we start at the county level analysis, we have our most granular, our most detailed kinds of data. And if we were to build a data set, we would have over 3,000 cases, one for each county, measuring perhaps the average income. We could also aggregate our data if we were interested in regional analyses. And so I have the census divisions here, New England, Mid-Atlantic, and so forth. There's nine of them. We could further collapse it into regions, the east, the northwest, the south or west, and then we could even further subdivide that into two groups, the frost belt and the sun belt. When we do any kind of statistics, when we uh, try to interpret our analysis, we need to pay attention to what it is we're measuring, how it's being measured, and the unit of analysis, and particularly the, the uh, unit of aggregation. Are we looking at average incomes for individuals, for communities, for counties, for regions, or, or uh, other kinds of units? This logic applies to other kinds of measurements as well. We can measure corporations, and we can look at, say, the total uh, profits of corporations, but corporations can also be categorized by industry. So you get the idea that the statistics are difficult to interpret without knowing the unit of analysis. Census Bureau collects a lot of different data, and I love the graphic that you see on the left. If you look at the tree trunk down the middle, it shows the major uh, levels of aggregation of census data. The Census Bureau has data down to the level of the block, places where we live. They also can produce the data in block groups, census tracts, counties, states, divisions, regions, and then, of course, as a nation um, as a whole. The branches off of that tree trunk are kind of sub-studies that they do at different levels of analysis. For example, at the state level, you can see that the Census Bureau produces reports on school districts, congressional districts, economic places, and so forth. I like this table at the, on the right, not because I'm so interested in the data in it, but because it shows you how to build a, a, really, a truly good table. It has a great title. By looking at the title, you, tell, you can tell exactly what's in the table. So if you were looking through the, the table of contents or to find a listing of tables online, you would know if this is what you were interested in. At the bottom of the table uh, are, is a footnote that explains where the data comes from. This is really important to verify. There's so much data available today, and often people have a political uh, bent to the re kind of reporting that they're doing, and um, they, they kind of cherry pick data to make a point. And so, um, you know, and that's okay, I think, as long as you know where they're getting their data from and you can evaluate whether you think um, the, the quality or kind of data they used influences their uh, conclusions. So we have a really good example here of a nice footnote describing where the data come from. And then in the table, we have just a ton of information. For example, we have for the entire United States, we can see that in current dollars um, in 1980, the per capita, personal income per capita was $10,091. We can break that out by state. And of course, once we have the states, we could go ahead and put it into census regions or census divisions and aggregate to different levels. So all in all, I really like this table quite a bit and, uh, and, and feel like this is a table you could study as you build your own tables for your reports in college. Um, you know, this is a good template for the kinds of information you would want in a table. So let's push on to frequency distributions. A frequency distribution, simply put, is just a table of outcomes. By outcomes, we mean those, that's the, the categories um, of the things that we're measuring. And we simply keep a tally of the number of times that each of those outcomes occurred. So uh, I'm looking here at this variable from the General Social Survey in 2004 called Soch Bar, which asked people how frequently they spend an evening at a bar or a tavern. 
you can see that um, the mnemonic is so bar that the values, the possible outcomes, are 1 through 7, and that the attached value labels, the labels that, um, that are important for us as researchers, attached to those numbers range from almost daily, several times a week, several times a month, once a month, several times a year, once a year, to never. Now this table, um, th these data, happen to be discrete and orderable. And discrete variables are the easiest to make frequency distributions. All we need to do is make certain that our categories are mutually exclusive and that they're exhaustive. By mutually exclusive, what I mean here is that when I look at a person's survey response, I can assign them to one of these one of these seven categories, but only to one of the seven categories. And by exhaustive, it means that I don't have something left over that doesn't fit into a category. Sometimes you'll see an other category for things that are um, difficult to classify, and sometimes you'll just see those, those responses drop from the analysis. In our frequency table itself, we, we can provide the frequencies in um, three different ways. One, we could just provide the simple counts. So we can see that in 2004, uh, out of 905 people in, who responded to this question, 432 responded that they never socialized at a bar or a tavern. Um, we can convert those frequencies to percentages. So in that same category, we take 432, divide that by 905, and uh, multiply that by 100, and find out that approximately 48% of the people sampled in 2004 never spend an evening at a bar or tavern. And then we can produce what's called the cumulative frequency distribution, which in this case starts at the bottom and just adds up all those individual percentages. So the first one is 0 0.07. The second one is 7.8, which is 7.2 plus 0.7. There's a little bit of rounding error here. And it tells us that 7.8% of the sample uh, claim to go to a bar or tavern several times a week or less. If we go look at another number, category 5, the several times a year, we can see the cumulative frequency distribution is 36.6, which tells us that approximately 37 percent of our sample uh, claim to go to a bar several times a year or less. That is, that's the value of the 11.9 percent in category 5, plus the 10.1 in category 4, plus the 6.7 in 3, the 7.2 in 2, and the 0.7 in category number 1. So this is pretty much the, uh, what a univariate frequency distribution is, but I'm going to give you a little bit more information on how to construct this kind of, frequen um, this kind of frequency distribution and why percentages are preferred. So in the old days when we did this kind of stuff by hand, we might go out on the street and ask people their party identification, and we would make a tally sheet. And here you can see that uh, every time a person told me they um, were a member, they identify with the Republican Party, I put an X in a box, and I've grouped these X's in groups of five so that they're very easy to count. So at the end of this, I would get rid of the tally marks, the X's, and just leave me with the frequencies, the 37, the 47, 23, and so forth. This table, again, I'm trying to follow some good uh, design principles, has a nice title, and you'll notice I do have a source of the data, and um, this tells you not to trust these data, that these are just made up for an example here. This is what my publication ready table would look like. I've converted everything to percentages, and I've included a note in the title indicating the sample size. So this is the kind of thing that would go into, you know, an, an honors report or a, a thesis or something you're turning in for a, another class. So here's the problem uh, by of presenting simply the raw numbers. If I go out and now I repeat my study, and I've done this in two different places. I've done it in small town and big town. And I've calculated the frequencies of party identification for each of these locations. Notice the italicized F is a, is a shorthand, statistical shorthand for frequency. It makes it difficult to make direct comparisons. It seems that Republicans are more prevalent in big town than they are in small town. But the problem here is that these two, the, the numbers in the two columns are not comparable because in small town I only surveyed 125 people, but in big town I surveyed 230. So a direct comparison is difficult with the raw numbers. What we need to do is do a little extra work and convert these to percentages. Now we can see that the relationship actually shifts, that um, proportionally there's fewer Republicans in big town compared to small town. 
So my, it, my suggestion to you here is that never present the raw frequencies. Always present the percentages so that people can compare them easily and make certain you let people know the sample size so that they understand the quality of your estimates. Well, that's it on uh, univariate frequency distributions for discrete variables. We'll have another video on how to calculate frequency distributions for grouped data. There, uh, it's done identically, except there's a little more uh, difficulty and thought process that has to go into how to group your data. As usual, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me, and I'll do my best to answer them.